The Mr. Beacon Podcast presents Building the Web of Things, Everything, with guest Dominique Gennard, CTO of Everything. Sponsored by Williot, scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. So Dominique Gennard, uh, CTO of Everything, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us on the, on the Mr. Beacon Podcast. We're going to talk about two things, I don't know if, if we're going to have time for both in one episode, but... The first thing that I want to talk about is your book, um, uh, Building the Web of Things. And I I bought a copy um, and I've been working through it and I I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think you've done an amazing job. It's super practical. And what I like is for those of us who talk about the Internet of Things and cloud services, you make it really specific and real and you allow us to actually, with a remarkably small amount of work, achieve a huge amount um, with very simple exercises. Um, And then before you know it, you're like really deep into into stuff. And it's very helpful for me uh, because I see my job, part of my job, is helping to build solutions. And I may be a marketing guy, but I'm trying to figure out what are the pieces and how do they work together. And this really is a core to it. And I've done, I think you've done an amazing job. So thank you. let's talk about it. So first of all, tell us what, what's the difference between the web of things and the internet of things? Well, I think the difference is in you know exactly what you said before so you said with a with a small amount of work you actually managed to build an end to end application right mm-hmm. and a lot of the work in the in the internet of things in the early years of the IoT was really on networking protocols right developing new networking protocols sometimes competing protocols to bring things to the internet very little work was done in terms of understanding how these things that were on the internet would actually integrate into the application ecosystem. And the web of things is, is, is really about that. It's really about trying to think about the application layer that we would build on top of the internet of things. And it, you know, just like the web made the internet successful, it's trying to show you how the web can make the internet of things successful. It requires some tweaking, some, some protocols need to be adapted. But overall, you can fairly quickly create big solutions by using scalable web technologies on top of things. And, and tell us, for those who haven't seen the book before, what are the web technologies that you explain? What are the building blocks? So for those who are fairly technical, these are straightforward technologies like um, HTTP and WebSocket. So, so technologies are already um, you know, widespread web technologies. So yeah, HTTP, WebSocket, then using JSON for uh, you know uh, actually representing the uh, the data, mm-hmm. um, using the web security mechanisms such as TLS, but then also it goes beyond the the basic uh, building blocks of the web to extend into, for instance, the semantic web using semantic web technologies to not only connect things to the web, but also make them findable and usable on the web. Or it also looks into uh, using the social, the social web to build a social web of things, because mm-hmm. there are nice, nice ways of sharing things using, uh, using social web technologies. So, so it looks at basically what can you put in the IoT toolbox from the web that can be useful to connect things. And I think the great thing is you, you start off with REST, API, uh, REST APIs, which is basically a URL, uh, and you type things in, and the way you've got it set up, we can actually get results very quickly. And um, I think, uh, so, so I, what I've seen is you've got kind of two paths. One is um, the, the Raspberry Pi piece. So basically, I, I bought my own here, and um, it's... The size of a, it came in the size, a box the size of a can of Altoids, and I think it cost me like twenty-five dollars. And I've got a computer here that has a USB connection, an HDMI connection, probably has Bluetooth in. I haven't got that that far. Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Just absolutely amazing, um, but a little daunting because it doesn't come in a nice box and and so forth. And um, what I love is that you've got 
this setup already available because it's the web and it's actually somewhere around here. Where is it? The, 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 the system that we can access. Yeah, it's at the back of the room actually. And uh, I, you know, I cannot take credits for that. This was the, um, somehow the, the, the publisher Manning was, uh, you know, they read the, the draft and they were like, your book is great, but to actually get the power of the story you're telling, you almost need to get to the end. So they were asking us, is there a way to show from chapter one onwards or chapter two, the full extent of what you can do with the web and things, right? And that's when we started thinking, well, we can put that device on the web and let people try from the word go, actually. What I found myself doing was typing in a few URLs and I'm suddenly browsing a computer and seeing what the sensors are and being able to display my name on a computer in your office thousands of miles away. Um, so it's fantastic. Um, so what I can't believe is that you're CTO of a company like Everything and you wrote that book at the same time. How did you do it? How did you do that? Yeah, I mean, the, the original idea for writing that book came out of, um, out of our PhD thesis. So both Vlad and I wrote um, probably the two first PhD thesis on, on the web of things. And, mm -hmm. and then we were contacted by Manning and we thought, hey, we can just reuse our PhD thesis and convert it into a book, right? We were young and naive and uh, it didn't really work that way, right? But the initial plan was to spend a couple of weeks during the summer holidays on, on converting that, right? It absolutely did not work like that. Uh, we ended up having to work on it for uh, 18 months. It was basically every weekend. Every weekend for 18 months we were working on that. Um, so you have very tolerant wives, girlfriends, whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. She was really tolerant. She actually pushed me. and. Uh, to get it done. Thankful for that, yeah. So I, years and years ago, I wrote a book on Unix device drivers with someone that I worked with. And at the beginning of the book, we got on great. By the end of it, we weren't speaking. So <laughs> Vlad and you, do you still speak no, with each other? we're still very, very good friends. So, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's very well. impressive that you managed to do that. Um, OK, so we've talked about some of the technologies. Um, uh, uh, what has this book got to do with your day job, with, with everything? Well, so the way we started everything, the, the, the company was very much as, a, as an extension of the research we were doing on, on bringing web technologies to uh, embedded devices, but also to all kinds of connected things, right? So if you want the core of the technology we're presenting in the book is the core of the technology that the Everything platform is built on. Mm -hmm. and, and at Everything, we help um, customers connecting their products to the web, right? So that's, that's the core of what we're doing. So somehow, this is a short condensed version of, of what we're doing uh, at Everything. So, so what is in the core of the Everything platform then? You're, you're helping, you're helping uh, brands, consumer packaged goods companies establish a digital link with a physical product, whether it's a Coke bottle or a, a shirt or what are some of the things that you've done that with? Give me, give, give me a few examples. Yeah, so, so, so that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah? We are, we're basically giving a URL to every single object and, and providing an API for these objects so they get a, a digital twin, so to say. In terms of examples, um, probably one of the most well-known brands is Coca-Cola. So we, with them, we worked on actually enabling billions of um, identities on, on Coke cans and Coke products. And this allows them to run marketing campaigns, um, to run loyalty programs, but also to learn more about the flow of their products uh, and, and understand how they're being used. It's, it's the first time they can really create a link between people and products without having to go through intermediaries. Which is a huge is deal. It's yeah. massively disruptive exactly. because traditionally maker of consumer product hands it off to sometimes a multi-tiered distribution chain and they have no idea who's at the other end of it. Maybe they run a contest with a card to get you to register and we all know that no one registers the products that exactly. they buy. I think what's fascinating is that when you tell people that story, they go like, but in what terms is this the Internet of Things, right? And actually, if you look at the definition of the Internet of Things, it came out in, uh, in 99 from, from a set of laboratories called the Auto ID Labs, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, at MIT and, and ETH Zurich, and uh, and a, and a um, researcher called Kevin Ashton, I think he was a co um, one of the co-directors of the lab, needed to present to Procter and Gamble the digitalization strategy uh, for their products, mm -hmm. and started thinking, well, you could put a, an RFID tag on every Procter and Gamble product, and you could connect them together to form an Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. So the Internet of Things itself was born with the notion of CPG products being connected together, right? So today, you know, the rest is history, and today we really see the Internet of Things as smart homes, smart cities, but I think there's much more to it, right? It's, mm -hmm. there are, yeah, there are, you know, millions of consumer electronic products out there, but there are actually trillions of CPG and apparel products or, or lower cost products that actually can benefit from being interconnected as well. How many products do you have in your database? Um, so unique products, uh, we connect about uh, 1 billion unique products right now. Um, if you consider products that are not uniquely identified, but identified at the, at the product category level, uh, that's uh, several billions of products. So we register several billions of transactions on products. But there's a difference whether it's uniquely identified or not. Can you explain that a little bit more so I can imagine there's this kind of trend in package, consumer packaged goods, especially pharmaceuticals, to serialize uh, because everyone wants to be able to identify what was the product that you have for warranty reasons and to track whether it's authentic and maybe if there's a recall they want to know that. But when would you not have that unique identity? That's a good question. Actually, if you have the unique identity, you are in a much better place. And I think the, the number of applications that can be based just on the fact that you have a unique identifier for products are, are almost unlimited, right? Um, the reason you don't get unique identifiers yet is simply the cost. Um, although it may seem trivial to print, for instance, a unique QR code on a product mm -hmm. at massive speeds, such as, you know, the speed brands like Coca-Cola or Nestle need to, to print their packaging at, this has a big cost. Just slowing down the printing process to print unique identities has a massive cost, which is something I discovered, actually. I didn't imagine that. I, I was talking to someone at one of the CPG companies, and they described a rookie mistake they made where they, I think they dropped something in the production process, and the products were being produced at, like, a freight train just coming off the production line and basically the whole thing exploded and it, and it was catastrophic for, for a short period of, of time. Actually uh, stopping the press is, is challenging and that becomes, you talked about it's difficult with the QR code and I mean what happens with radio technologies? Uh, how, how do you get a unique ID and an RFID tag if you're producing? Yeah, this is, this is why this type of technologies are still limited to higher higher end products, right? So, for instance, we use NFC and RFID in apparel. With uh, with um, we have a, a big contract with a, a labeling company called Avery Denison. They produce a lot of labels for apparel brands, and through that contract, we basically enable apparel brands to to put digital identities on their product, unique digital identities. And that's when you start to see RFID tags or NFC tags um, or even higher end technologies such as Bluetooth, uh, low energy and so on. I think this is, this is currently the limit. But I also see it shifting, right? I think even five years ago it was a no-go to put an NFC tag in an apparel item simply because of the cost. This is already changing. So mm -hmm. I think we'll see a little revolution in smart packaging in the next few years actually. So, you know, one of the things that's happened is the cost of RFID tags has gone down. And I think if you're buying a billion, you can get them for just a few cents, five cents or less even. I think less, yeah. But um, um, is that still money uh, on the cost of something where they're very um, sensitive to increasing the cost? What are your thoughts on the um, kind of their, those organizations coming to terms with the return on investment? Uh, because if it's coming all coming out of the packaging guy's budget, then he's not going to like it. 
Um, but the benefits are all to the marketing organization and so forth. Are, are companies getting it together in terms of funding it or, or is it still a zero-sum game where, where you're fighting for pennies out of the packaging? Yeah, it's, it, it, it requires a little bit of mind shift, right? Because if, if, you, if you digitally enable your products just for a particular marketing campaign, then that, that's, that's not really product digitalization, right? You need to think of that in broader terms. You need to imagine that every single product now has an identity and that you can develop uh, a number of applications and a number of, of, of returns on investment on top of that technology. You really see, need to see it as a platform rather than a one-off um, you know, kind of campaign for a product. And, and that's tricky because it means the packaging um, people have to be on board to basically put the digital trigger uh, or even the piece of electronic on the product, um, but they don't do that only for them, they do that for other parts of the organization, such as the marketing or, or um, you know, supply chain or, or product authenticity, which can be very different uh, parts of an organization. So it's really this, this platform thinking that I think brands need to start to have. And, and for us, when, when brands start to get that, that, that it's not only a way to run a one-off campaign, but rather a, a platform play, to digitalize their products. When this happens, then, then that's when the magic happens, right? Because then they can see the return across multiple um, applications. To me, it's just a matter of time before all high-end CPG companies latch onto this. The, the, the benefit of knowing who your customer is and being able to um, satisfy problems like uh, grey markets and uh, authenticating that the product is a real product and uh, potentially replenishment, automatic replenishment of products as they get worn out and consumed is just kind of a no-brainer and it's really just up to McKinsey to start a practice and kind of get at the CEO level and the board level which is really what it requires in my opinion. The thing that I haven't really figured out is what's in it for the consumer. So can you give some examples of what you've seen that works? Why would a consumer want um, a, a dress or a handbag with um, an RFID or hopefully from our perspective, from Williot's perspective, a Bluetooth tag in it? Um, there's certainly lots of things they can be afraid of, like privacy and so forth. What's on the other side of the ledger that would actually make them want to have a yeah. digitally connected piece of apparel? Yeah, and uh, that is such an important question. Uh, I, I remember when I was at the Auto ID Labs, which were, these were the early years of EPC RFID, so putting unique uh, product code on RFID tags. And I remember one episode where a deployment at Walmart of EPC tags led to people chaining themselves at the store doors to not let the goods with RFID tags getting in, right? And, I, and this really, you know, struck me and I was, I was like, why, why do they see such a big problem? And I think the reason is they saw no benefit for them in that, right? And, and we naturally, this is the case with mobile phone or with any technology that, that eats a little bit of our privacy, we put things on a balance, right? what do I get and what do I have to give, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't quite get the, the balance correctly, but we always look at cost and benefit at the end of the day. So it's very important that CPG brands and apparel brands and anyone who is putting this digital technology on their products really thinks about, you know, there must be a big win for the consumer. Um, in terms of big wins for the consumer as well, Concrete examples, obviously marketing, um, promotion, loyalty is, is, is what comes to mind at first, but there are, there are slightly more subtle uh, use cases. You, you talked about product authenticity, which is a big deal in apparel, for instance, but also even in CPG, uh, drinks, you know, high-end drinks and so on. Certainly pharmaceuticals. You want to know that the medicine is the real thing. Don't you? Yeah, exactly. In pharmaceuticals. In pharmaceuticals, there's also a legal framework uh, facilitating that, right? Because there are now legal requirements to be able to trace the goods. Um, but th that's one aspect. And then you can think of, you know, beyond just um, an identity, an identifier, if you start thinking about sensing capabilities, right? The kind of things Williot is, is also looking at. 
then there is an added benefit, right? You can know, for instance, the temperature of, of a product um, across, across the supply chain. Um, and this, for some products, is tremendously important, such as for um, you know, medicine and drugs or, or, or also edible products. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we're just at the beginning of understanding the benefits of, of putting digital triggers on, on, uh, on you know, CPG apparel and all kinds of goods, actually. Very good. Well, this has been great. We could talk for hours, but I want to quit whilst we're ahead because uh, I, I just want to say this book is tremendous for anyone who is even people that aren't technical, then you can play a bit and see some results and start to demystify the, some of the buzzwords that we use without really knowing what they mean and you can figure out what they mean by using it and getting results. And then uh, I applaud what you guys are doing with the platform, which is at one level kind of technical infrastructure, but I think you've done a great job of enabling some very practical use cases with some, some great brands. So thanks very much for talking with us. Thank you very much. All right. So Dominic, what three songs would you take to Mars? Okay, yeah, that's by far the trickiest question I ever got asked. I think I would pick um, the Beatles across the universe. All right. For the journey. I yes, think. very good. That's the first time we've had that one, but very appropriate for a Martian trip. And, and then I would pick uh, one of my favorite bands, it's called Roiksop. And um, it's a Swedish electronic brand, band, and I mm -hmm. would pick uh, The Girl and the Robot, which is about this, um, you know, about the, you know, the encounter of robots and, and humans and what that can bring and, and the good things and the bad things. Are you optimistic about what's going to happen in terms of our future with robots or do you think we're just an evolutionary stage and we're going to be passing the baton on to the robots? I'm, I'm, op I'm, I'm optimistic. I think um, it, it's going to be bumpy and that's basically what the song you know, tells, but there is a happy ending. Okay, happy. very good. And then the last one, uh, I would pick Kraftwerk uh, Radioactivity because you just have to, right? If you're on Mars, you have to pick some kind of hardcore electronic songs. Yeah, love Kraftwerk. So no Jean-Michel Jarre, I apologize if that seems a stereotypical... No, actually uh, I'm a big fan, so yeah, yeah I could have picked Oxygen. one of those, but I had two minutes to choose it. So. Well, I think you've done very well. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. The Mr. Beacon Podcast is sponsored by Williot, scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth.